Well, amen and amen to that. Join me in prayer as we continue our worship through understanding time here at Elevating Life Church. Lord, we praise you for your righteousness and thank you for your true, just, and certain ways. Forgive us for responding to any other way other than obedience towards your commands. We ask through Jesus Christ for support as we come together in agreement to carry out your great commandment and commission. We now give complete attention to your voice to receive the message this morning. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, good morning. Good morning and good morning. It's wonderful to see everyone this morning. Uh, if you're new here, my name is Drake. I am the senior pastor here at uh, the church. And know that uh, we're always thankful to have guests. So thank you for being with us as well. We're so thankful for our regular attendees. And let me say this. We're so thankful for our, our membership because it's the membership that comes together as teams, uh, providing resources, money to make sure that ministry happens here uh, in uh, Morgan County right here at the church. So thank you to all of them. We're so thankful for them. And again, thank you to everyone. And again, good morning. Today, to begin the message, we're going to be in the book of Psalms. Psalms 89.52 to kick off the message. Psalms 89.52. Now, as you're turning there, just let me give you a little recap of where I've been for the last couple of weeks. Uh, last week, Sherry and I attended... Uh, the debrief for the Global Leadership Network Summit that we hosted here in August. Uh, we, we went to Chicago, Illinois. Uh, Illinois, not noise. They get upset when you use the S on the end. I found that out this last week. Uh, the debrief itself was with uh, Craig Groeschel, if you recall him. He was the host of this event, along with his GLN faculty staff. And there was only about 50 people, uh, when all said and done, at the actual debriefing, which was the last two hours of the two days we were there. And so 50 people compared to the hundred thousands of people who attended uh, the, the summit worldwide. So it was very, very intimate indeed. Let me say that. Now at the debriefing itself, it was interesting. On the second day, Sherry and I was given a tour of the actual room. I don't know why we were the only ones given this tour, uh, but we were given this tour of the room where this impressive event took place. And if, if you recall, there it is. There's there's that massive room uh, that was used for this event. And this, this room, as you can see, was ginormous uh, compared to, let's say, our 125-seat auditorium here. Now, this room sits about 7,500 people. Now, once in the auditorium, we were brought to the stage uh, in the front, and I turned around and looking over the auditorium standing there, it definitely gave you a sense of the magnitude of the event. It was, it was massive. It was, I will say this in the sense of that moment, it was a wow moment for sure. Can you, I mean, can you imagine, let's say 8,000 to 10,000 people in front of you live with a worldwide influence or audience of over 100,000 people? It, it's pretty massive. Now, after our VIP treatment, as I put it, uh, and back into the debriefing room itself, one of the participants turned to me and asked, is that the dream? You know, the dream to speak and to influence uh, thousands, if not millions of people all at once. Now, he must have been confused because I, I gave him this very puzzled look. I paused just for a moment, and said, dream? What are you talking about? That's not the dream. Maybe a goal, but never the dream. The dream I shared is to live a fulfilled and happy life through Jesus Christ where I can lead myself, perhaps others, and maybe even an organization and others in a way that helps everyone become better. Amen. 
And I said this, become better no matter where I may be. In front of a hundred thousand people or speaking with, with you, sir, period. Again, I said, the dream is never wealth. Be it a number of people in front of you or dollars in the bank. I hope we see that. The dream is a holy and good life through Jesus Christ, where everyone benefits and we get to pay it forward. And that person, the gentleman, just looked at me and said, Amen. amen. <laughs> so with that, Amen, let's continue our year-long message series, Life rock on. And of course, life represents living in the Christian faith, and we got to have those boundaries there. We're going to miss the mark. Living life in the Christian faith every moment of every day. And of course, rock on is that biblical perspective, uh, our view on life, how we live standing on the rock solid principles and ways of God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. This week... We're going to be looking at an unfamiliar rock song that John just shared. An unfamiliar rock song to get us into the message today titled, Amen. That's the title of the message this morning, Amen. So with that, read with me Psalms 89, 52. Very simple, straightforward, direct verse right out of the book of Psalms. And of course, the psalmist simply says this. Praise be to the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, D, referring to the Trinity, God the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, forever. Every time I say that, I think of Sandlot, forever, for you guys that know Sandlot, pray, you got it, praise be to the, I didn't expect you guys to know it. <laughs> Here we go again. Uh, praise be to the Lord forever. Amen and amen. I can get it out, right? Amen and amen. Our song this week to just uncover some uh, principle of God here is amen. Now let me ask you this. Is there anyone familiar with this song that's performed by Kid Rock? Anyone? A couple. We are all familiar with it now. You should all raise your hand. You just heard it. <laughs> and yes, most people would not consider this song to be a classic rock song because, first of all, it was released in 2007, not too long ago. But I never said the song had to be classified by some authority to be considered a classic rock song. To a five-year-old, this song is a classic one. <laughs> Amen. So as Jesus suggests this morning, let's be like that child and be curious, learn, and enjoy. Now, at this point, I wish I had some deep, meaningful story behind this song, but I don't. Basically, Kid Rock... His name's Robert James Ritchie. There is, if you don't know what he looks like, that's what he looks like. I thought it'd be interesting. He was challenged to write this song by his producer who thought he could write more meaningful and deeper songs. So Kid Rock, and by the way, if you know Kid Rock in, in, the, in the very light songs or surface songs, they're not very deep, right? So his producer challenged him. So with that, with that challenge and with the with the attitude, I'll show him, Kid Rock's attitude, he wrote the song, Amen. Now, Kid Rock, understanding how powerful the word Amen was, or is, and overlooking the ocean of Malibu, California, rough living, <laughs> wrote the song voicing his frustrations with the problems in American society during the war in Iraq and the famine in Africa. And after writing the song, Kid Rock claimed the song was the best he has ever written. And with that claim, personally speaking, I say, amen. If you know his work, which I do, it is his best. The best amen that he could put in place anyway. 
So with his amen in place, his best amen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever wondered why we say amen? Why we end our prayers and perhaps our statements with amen? Have you ever wondered? I have. And everybody said, well, duh, that's all you do. <laughs> the word amen is translated from the Hebrew and Greek language, languages, which are primary languages used in the Bible and literally means so be it. It's used both in the Old and New Testament. Amen and amen. Now in the Old Testament, like Kid Rock's song, often people use the term amen, so be it, in response to the setbacks, the obstacles, the problems where various sins or wrongdoings were getting in the way of God's direction, God's leadership in, in a person's life, be it individually or collectively, let me say. In other words, in the Old Testament, people would say, amen, so be it, to the curse or the toxic life that follows when someone has a belief or an attitude of, I'll do what I want, as John shared last week, and I've shared the whole year. When someone chooses self-centeredness over God-centeredness, the curse or this toxic life always follows. And there is nothing anyone can do except for that person with that relationship with God to make the decision to step into God's ways. And when someone decided to go in their own way, and this toxic like life followed, the only response a person could have is amen. So be it, you chose that life. We see this type of amen response in the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 27, and we're going to just look at a couple of verses here just to kind of get that gist of what what the curse or the toxic life is referring to, I'm referring to. Deuteronomy 26, and we'll look at 15 and 26. There's a long list there. We don't have time. So we'll look at the book ends of this curse. Uh, Moses begins with one curse and ends with another. So let's look at it. Moses, in the book of Deuteronomy, writes this, cursed. And when you see cursed, think of a toxic life or perhaps dysfunctionality. And would people agree with us? We kind of live in a toxic and dysfunctional time. Cursed is anyone who makes an idol. And you see that big dash there. Didn't know you are going to get an English lesson here. That long dash is an M dash, which means dramatic pause. Stop. Don't miss this. So let me share it again. Cursed is anyone who makes an idol. He wants you to make sure you understand what an idol is. What is an idol? Well, there's many different forms of idol. First and foremost... People can become an idol. Either themselves, my goal is to be that shooting star, as bad company sings. To be something greater than whatever, than God. I think of a person perhaps, maybe they're not shooting after that idolism, but they idol somebody under God. That way. That person is an idol. So a person can be an idol. A dream can be an idol. You see, a dream, when it's not being produced in the sense the way God wants it, and it becomes reality, it's just a dream. You ever met a dreamer that just lives in dreams and nothing is truly produced? They're not living in reality? Idol. Another idol. Oh, I can go all day on this one is the objects. Now we understand this because we understand stuff, be it money, be it a piano, be it the pulpit that took us two years to get out of this building. <laughs> Somebody's laughing back here. 
idols, stuff, money, whatever can be an, uh, can be an idol. Or the last one I think of is a program or perhaps events or a cause. Because so many people will create a program. And ministries have to be careful. I'm always evaluating this to make sure that our program, what we're doing here, it does not become an idol. We want excellence and we want to glorify God, but we do not want to become an idol where we're a stepping stone uh, for somebody to become that idol on the other side of that coin. No, we're here to do it together with God and with our neighbor. And so you can see, cursed is anyone who makes an idol, a thing detestable to the Lord. The work of skilled hands, that means people. It's their doing, not with God. And sets it up in secret. This is important to understand because this just simply means I'll do what I want. Just let me do it my way in any of your relationship because it's easier. Let me just set it up in secret. It's easier if I do it by myself. I don't need anybody. It's just me and God. You're missing the great commandment. We're missing the others. And we set it up in secret. By myself. And Moses says, Cursed is anyone who makes an idol. Then all the people said, Ooh, that was a tight, soft amen. Then he goes through a list. Man, am I running out of time? <clears throat> but he gets to this very last one and says, Curse is anyone who does not uphold the commands or the words of this law. This is the Torah at the time, the book of the, the Pentateuch. Uh, we're in the book of Deuteronomy, but who does not uphold the commands or the words of this law and being carrying, or, or by carrying them out. They're not active in, in it. They might believe in it, but there's no activity. When you just have belief with no activity, you don't have faith. When you have belief and activity coming together, you have faith. And so cursed is anyone who does not uphold the words of the law by carrying them out. Then all the people shall say, Amen. Amen. Here in the book of Deuteronomy, these passages indicate the so be it, the amen uh, in the righteous sentencing or the curse that people suffer when they decide to do life their way, in secret. uh, Please understand the curse is a choice of the one who chooses self-centeredness over God-centeredness. You know, I do what I want people. And it's not hard to spot people who are under this curse, even today. The curse happens when a person resists God's direction, alignment, and influence in any of their life roles, be it in their marriage or most intimate relationship, in their family, uh, in the church, in the community. It's just the righteous sentencing of the by, or it's a byproduct of a God who is holy, right, and just. You see, God is pure. And because he is pure, he is required to uphold his moral qualities. And if they are not honored by the person or by the community or by the relationship, the curse. Amen? That's harsh reality. I get it. Simply, no, that's good because we're not dreamers. See, I put that together? Okay. Simply put, the curse is the lack of peace, composure, serenity in a person's life. That's all it is. It's the absence of truly being with God and with others. You see, hurry, worry, and flurry are the self serving biases and self imaging of the person who is under this curse. So the question is, are you living under the curse? So on this one side of this discussion, the first amen, it is an amen to the righteous and just sentencing, the curse of God towards people who decide to do it their way. 
I want you to think about it. What else can a Christian say when a person continues to do it their way and refuses to lead, to be led, to be helped, to, to be guided to a well-lived and fulfilled life through Jesus? The only response to the one who continues to live in the suffering of this curse, and these folks know who they are, is so be it. Amen. And I, listen, I don't have time to stumble over other people's choices. The choice is either to live in the curse or surrender all to God. Not to be a religious freak, but to be a faithful person to his ways. To the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, let me say this before I jump to the other side, and that's going to happen quick. Let's be careful with this amen, not to allow this amen, if you will, to be said with a, with a joyful heart. Just like God, our heart should be broken for the one who lives under this curse. We should never rejoice when it comes to the aspect of this amen, or have an attitude, or a contemptuous attitude, where we subconsciously say, well, that's what they get. Anybody know anybody like that? Well, that's what they get. No, if this is your attitude, and you need to examine deep, know this, if that's your attitude, you are living under the curse. Our attitude should always be Romans 12, 9, which clearly states from the Apostle Paul, Love must be sincere, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. In other words, love the sinner, hate the sin. It's about the curse, that first amen. The second one is simply put, and we know this, that's why I'm not going to spend a lot of time because you know what it is. The second amen is about the blessings of God. So we have people that Choose not to live under the blessings. You got those that do. One is that amen, it breaks your heart. But the other one is a joyful amen because people are making the decision, making the choice to live under God's blessing. And we see this in the New Testament time and time and time again, where it refers to the amen of the mode of life, the way. It refers to the reality of life, the truth. And it refers to the experience of life through Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. It's the blessings. And what a thrill it is to say amen when people decide, first of all, as individuals and as a church or collectively, whatever that relationship, decide to live in the blessings of God. So two aspects of amen. The curse, so be it. The blessings, so be it. The choice is yours to continue with I'll do what I want attitude or go deeper with the, and go deeper with the hurry, worry, and flurry of the curse or surrender your heart. That means your desires. That means your hopes. That means your interests. Uh, that means your ambitions. That means your dreams. That means your affections, what you like over to him in a way that sanctions you to be a blessing wherever you may be, on a massive stage, influencing hundreds of thousands, or one-on-one -on -one with your neighbor. Now we know why we say amen and amen. Psalms 89, 52, once again, to remind us of these beautiful words of the psalmist. It says, praise be to the Lord forever. Amen and amen. Amen. The message. Amen. Rock on. Rock on. Rock on.